All right. So uh, I am interested in a number of areas of psychology. I'm actually a physiological psychologist by training, although since I was here last year, two years ago, I've actually also been certified as an applied behavior analyst. So I'm actually now working in an area of applied psychology as well. But uh, when I heard who our plenary speaker was and the work that has been done on uh, she has done on heroines, particularly dystopian heroines in young adult literature, uh, I decided I really had to speak on this topic because in addition to loving Harry Potter, I also have been a big fan of uh, the Hunger Games series and of the Divergence series. And, uh, and I, I think in many ways, uh, the Harry, of course, the Harry Potter series paved the way in so many ways for these very, very popular series of books that followed it, like The Hunger Games and like Divergent and, and other series like that. And I really think Hermione and the, and the strong character that she was really paved the way for these other books to feature women or female characters as the main protagonist, uh, unlike Harry Potter, which of course the protagonist is Harry Potter. But uh, so I wanted to talk today about a uh, comparison between Hermione and the heroine of the Divergent series, who is Triss Pryor. So when you think of a young adult protagonist that is somewhat like Triss, who is the per first person who usually comes to mind? Katniss, Katniss Evergreen from The Hunger Games, yes. In fact, uh, Divergent has been accused of being kind of a Hunger Games uh, ripoff. I don't think it is. I think it's a much better series in its own right and far more than a, than, uh, a, a Hunger Games ripoff. But uh, I'm going to argue today here that actually Triss has more in common with Hermione than she may have with Katniss. And I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, the main reason is uh, both of them, both of these books feature a type of personality testing that all the characters undergo in order to fit into their society. In Harry Potter, of course, it's the sorting hat. And it, Hermione was hard to classify by the sorting hat. If you remember from the original book, the sorting hat took almost four minutes to decide to put her in Gryffindor. We are later told that this makes her a near hat stall from some Pottermore material, that someone who uh, the sorting hat takes more than five minutes to make up its mind is called a hat stall, and Hermione came close to being that. But the choices for her were either Gryffindor, the brave, or Ravenclaw, the smart. And ultimately, she was placed into Gryffindor. Uh, we don't know if that was her choice or if the hat made that choice for her. Of course, we know that for Harry, that it was his choice to go to Gryffindor instead of Slytherin. We actually aren't told that about Hermione. It just said the hat decided. Well, so we don't know to what extent that was her choice. But I like to think it was uh, the sorting hat listened to choices uh, for other people other than Harry. In Divergent, of course, all the kids are subjected to this aptitude test before they choose their faction that they will uh, be affiliated with for life. And Triss was a Divergent, meaning the aptitude test could not place her in a single faction. In fact, she showed equal aptitude for Dotless, the brave, Erudite, the smart, and then a third one, uh, Abnegation, the Unselfish. And if you've read the series, you know that one of the central themes is that being brave and being unselfish are really the same thing. So uh, you can think she was, in some ways, she was placed with the exact same choice Hermione was faced, and she also chose brave. So uh, I thought it was very interesting that both characters were faced with this choice, and both of them, uh, when faced with the choice of being affiliated with the smart or being affiliated with the brave, ultimately wound up affiliated with the brave. Uh, of course, Emma Watson we, I, did a wonderful job portraying Hermione and I think is very proud of the way she uh, shaped that helped shape that character. Uh, she was, of course, the brainy little girl. Uh, she was also, of course, a very beautiful young woman who is very, as you can see in the Yule Bar picture, but I think that we sometimes forget what a very powerful warrior she was. And in many ways, she was as much a fighter as Triss and Katniss and some of the heroines of this dystopian, which I'm, these dystopian series, which I'm sure we'll hear about more later today. But uh, both of these, both the Sorting Hat and the faction series uh, sequence of Divergent 
uh, have been shown to actually have connections to actual psychology testing. A study was done in 2005 by uh, Laurel Kreisel, uh, where she actually had people take their Pottermore sorting test and then gave them actual personality tests from psychology and found that there were relationships that uh, particularly people who were sorted into Slytherin were actually higher on some of the what they call the dark triad traits, things like narcissism, uh, Machiavellianism, uh, psychopathy. Uh, doesn't mean they're all psychopaths, but they actually did score higher on these tendencies. And that Ravenclaws, I'm a proud Ravenclaw myself, uh, stored, scored higher on their need for cognition, their need to be recognized for their intelligence. So I thought that was uh, very interesting. Uh, now the faction series of Divergent, uh, I have hypothesized for a number of years that uh, Veronica Roth based this series on a very popular or very common personality testing system for, from psychology, which is the uh, five-factor model, or the big five. And I'll show you why I think that happened anyway. But uh, Roth has said in, in interviews she was a psychology minor as well as a creative writing major when she wrote Divergent, and that she was very interested in psychology, especially as it relates to personality was one of the topics. And she also claims to have a long time and now abandoned obsession with personality tests. Well, I don't think she abandoned the, her obsession at all. I think she based her entire series around uh, the big five and some other popular personality tests. Uh, and a researcher in Brazil, uh, Bruno Campello de Sousa, uh, has actually given people the faction test that comes in uh, her one of her books, uh, it's a very simple test, only about seven questions, but actually has found that it relates to predictably to big five personality traits as well as some other personality traits as well. So both of these fictional ways of sorting or assessing uh, groups affiliation or group affiliation uh, actually have some connections to the type of personality psych tests that psychologists use. So uh, this is the big five model. It's often abbreviated OCEAN. It has uh, five traits. Uh, the first is openness to experience. Uh, this, in older versions, was actually called intellect. And of course, so that is associated with the erudite faction in Divergent. Um, the abnegation faction, if you know the abnegation, they're very neat, they're very orderly, they like everything on a schedule. Uh, this trait is conscientiousness. Uh, candor, uh, you have characters like Christine, who are very outgoing, very warm, uh, very personable, uh, like to seek attention. Uh, they are the extroverted uh, faction. Uh, if you remember, if you, their initiation test involves making people tell, tell truth serum and fill all their deepest secrets. This is not a test that an introvert would do particularly well on. So I think they're a, a very extroverted faction. The amity faction uh, is associated with agreeableness, kindness, trustness, eagerness to help. And then finally, you have your dauntless associated with this last trait, which is uh, called in some tests neuroticism, uh, where uh, it can be one extreme calm, even tempered, and secure, the other extreme anxious, uh, hostility, negative emotions. Uh, in some tests, this, this uh, factor is also called mental stability. Yes? It seems like all these could also apply to Elizabeth Warren. I'm not going to go there. We're, uh, uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's curious. When I was first working this out, uh, I had a little trouble with the Dauntless because it did not seem to match at first. You know, how can you be brave and also be neurotic? But uh, if you think about the Dauntless faction in this series, the kind of the old Dauntless uh, that's represented by four are, the, you know, this very this bravery, this standing up for others. But if you look at what Ford tells Triss that the initiation process in Dauntlet is supposed to teach you to do, it's supposed to teach you to keep a level head, you know, mental stability to be. Uh, now the newer Dauntless, Dauntless that's signified by the new leaders like Eric, uh, they have a very uh, Darwinian system. They do a lot of unnecessary risks, a lot of very reckless behavior. So that's more on the unstable end of that spectrum. 
So that is how I think Dauntless fits into that, and I think it's actually quite appropriate that their major activity is zip lining because uh, they are actually a faction that is starting on, uh, originated in this very level-headed, brave type, almost stoic type of thing, but has now slid down to this very reckless Darwinian dog-eat-dog uh, -dog type of, of system. So uh, another interesting factor about the personality in Divergent is you can, it's very easy to see how erudite matches up with intellect or openness. Very easy to see how agreeableness matches up with amity, uh, the kind or the peaceful. Dauntless, of course, we, we just talked about matching up with neuroticism and being represented on both poles and kind of actually bouncing between the two. Uh, there is a little issue with abnegation and candor, though. Uh, abnegation's trait is the, the selfless, the unselfish. Uh, and that doesn't exactly match conscientiousness. You can, in fact, be very uh, selfish and still be very neat and orderly. I think uh, Umbridge is an example of a <laughs> character like that, very self-centered, but also very orderly. Uh, as for candor, their trait is honesty. They call themselves the honest. Well, you can be very extroverted and attention-seeking and still be quite dishonest. Uh, we have. Gilderoy Lockhart is a nice example of, of that type of character. So, uh, but there is, uh, a number of years ago actually, in 2004, uh, a group suggested expanding this five-factor model to a six-factor model and adding this other factor they call the H factor, honesty and humility. And people who score high on honesty and humility are actually low on those dark triad, those Slytherin traits. But honesty and humility, now those are familiar terms. I think what Roth did is she took the honesty aspect of that and put it into candor, and she put the humility aspect into abnegation. So I think that's the personality uh, model that she set up the faction system on. I think that's why it worked so well as a, as a series, I mean, particularly uh, in the first two books when that was the real focus. Uh, for those of you who've read the full series, uh, Allegiant was not as good a book, in my opinion, and I think that's because they got out of the faction system and were no longer in that uh, environment. Uh, so, uh, now can we match the Hogwarts houses with the five-factor personality system? Uh, well, that's a little harder, of course, because four does not divide into five, but I think Ravenclaws are obviously a good match for the intellect or the openness, Gryffindors for the extroversion, Hufflepuffs, I think, have a bl nice blend of the conscientiousness and the agreeableness, both hardworking, dependable, organized, but also uh, kind, helpful, trusting. Slytherins, of course, do have the most negative emotions in the series in terms of uh, their being uh, anxious, unhappy, but they have uh, some traits from other faction, or other uh, domains as well. Uh, the goal-driven action, uh, or ambition aspect is actually from conscientiousness. The assertiveness, more from extroversion, and then uh, they're sort of on the low end of agreeableness in terms of being uncooperative, suspicious, it's very critical of others. So it's harder to match the, the houses of Hogwarts to the big five. Uh, I think that's because uh, Rowling did not, was not drawing on modern psychology for her society. She was drawing on traditional uh, elements, uh, the fire, air, water, and earth and the traditional humors uh, that many people are aware of from, from classical literature. I think those are better matches for the Hogwarts houses. So uh, going back to Hermione and Triss, uh, looking at how they would fall on these spectrums, uh, I think they're both very clearly very intelligent, so I would put them very high on the openness. Uh, I would also put them very high on the conscientiousness, the abnegation, hardworking, dependable. They're different in terms of the extroversion. Hermione is much more warm and outgoing, uh, whereas Triss is uh, much quieter and reserved by nature. Uh, they're also, I think, a bit different on agreeableness. Uh, Hermione, I think, would rate very highly on that. Triss, probably more in the middle ground on that. She's not always the most agreeable person. And then neuroticism, uh, they both have this, can, can have this uh, bravery, this calmness in the face of danger that, of course, served both characters very well. So I think uh, they match very closely, at least on those three personality factors, and I think that was reflected in their uh, original uh, sorting or their original uh, cho uh, 
choosing in their selection into factions. So, uh, yeah, did you have a comment? Um, I don't think, I, Hermione ends up very high on openness and agreeableness, but I don't think she started off that way. She mm -hmm. originally had no friends until after the troll, mm -hmm. and she was definitely bossy and a know-it-all. So yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. Although, you know, I was, I was rereading the first book, and I was looking at the first scene where we met her, though, and yes, she's, she's definitely a, a bit of a boss, bit of a know-it-all there, but the, what is she doing the first time we meet her? She's trying to help Neville find his toad. So I think if you look at actually what she's doing then, as opposed to sort of this act she's putting on to try to prove herself as a muggle-born, you really do see that core kindness in her right from the beginning, that she's helping this poor loser kid find his poor lost <laughs> toad. <laughs> uh, and uh, is showing that very kindness right from the start, so. Uh, yeah, I think that is uh, interesting. Of course, the extent to which these personality traits change over time, uh, particularly during adolescence, is of course a very uh, big area of interest as well by psychologists. But thank you. That is a that is a very uh, thoughtful comment. Uh, so my conclusions basically is that if you look at the actual personality studies, you see some very surprising similarities between Tris and Hermione. Uh, they're both split between smart and brave personality groups, but ultimately are grouped with the brave. Uh, the big five and hexaco models of personality are very important, I think, for understanding uh, the divergent faction system. Uh, Hogwarts houses are better suited to the traditional elements and tutors. But uh, both of these tests that come in these books show reliable connections to validated personality tests that are used by psychologists. And this isn't surprising because a lot of these tests originally developed from the study of language. They're from, a, from uh, the st a study of the different many, many adjectives that we have to describe personalities. So I think it's very natural that writers tap into these uh, very precise and very good at times models of personality. So uh, that's all I have at this point.